One, two, three. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the second part of uh, tonight's event. Um, May I ask also the remaining people that still want to join to come back? We we are, I apologize from the beginning, under a bit of time pressure, um, which you might realize if you look at the time. Um, so we we want to have an, an early start with, with our second um, part of the evening, which is uh, focused more on on kind of technical aspects. Um, after we had we have heard a lot about the or some of the personal accounts, uh, some of the stories um, that that were so so moving of people that were so courageous to come forward. Um, and and now, as I said, it's a bit more technical on the one hand. But on the other hand, um, it's it's just uh, basically evidence is what we need to translate uh, some of these stories into in order for for hope that was mentioned uh, before, uh, especially by Tarek in the panel discussion, uh, for hope to become something tangible in the end, um, and that is. Um, as, as, as you well know, that's what we strive for. We want to have accountability for this. We don't want um, the people that, that are so courageous to come forward. Uh, we want something to happen with these stories. And that's, that's when it comes, becomes very important what we will speak or what we will focus about um, on this second part. Um, and that's, that's the gathering of evidence, it's documentation, it's use, and, and the gaps that, that we still need for, for accountability. Um, before we start with the panel discussion, though, uh, we do have the great pleasure uh, of having with us uh, Catherine uh, Marchiuhel, uh, who is the first head since July um, of a mechanism called IIIM, and I will have to closely look at my notes in order to uh, spell it out correctly. So that is the International Impartial and Independent Mechanism to Assist in the Investigation and Prosecution of Persons Responsible for the Most Serious Crimes Under International Law Committed in the Syrian Arab Republic since March 2011. Uh, you will be asked on your way out if you can re-say the name completely um, <laughs> and remember it well. Now, um, the IIIM is just a very creative way by the General Assembly to try to overcome the deadlock within the Security Council uh, to prevent the crimes in Syria being dealt with by the permanent international criminal court. Uh, it's what uh, Lotte Leicht before called uh, one of the most innovative aspects of international criminal law really in a, in a long, long time. And it has two primary tasks. One of the tasks is to consolidate the con uh, existing evidence and uh, to analyze it and then ultimately put it into case files, case files that would be ripe and ready for prosecution. Um, and regarding this role, uh, Catherine, you said a couple of weeks ago that in order to build on the existing evidence and of the work, of the extensive work that has been done, um, that you want to establish a relationship of trust to organizations that have been, and individuals that have been, that have been uh, doing this kind of work. And I think many of them are, are here tonight. So of course, we would all be very excited to, to hear more about that. The second role of the IIIM is also to actively collect evidence. And being uh, aware of the work that was already done, you said also before that you would focus on gaps in existing evidence. And uh, of course, that's also something that I think would be very interesting to, to hear what, what kind of gaps do we, do we have still in, in the evidence uh, for the crimes in Syria. Um, just to be clear, the cases that are to be prepared by the IIIM uh, actually uh, still need a prosecution authority to take them up. Um, so um, without uh, an international or national prosecution authority, be it a tribunal or a court, um, these cases cannot go to court, but, but they can be prepared. But all of this, my, my very brief description taken together, um, I think you can imagine that the, that the task of the IIIM is a, is a very difficult one. Um, the one that you face, and, and having talked to people at the UN, uh, they told me that they could hardly imagine somebody more ideally suited to take up such a task than you, Catherine. Not only do you have 27 years of experience in French and international judiciary and public service in the field of international criminal law and transitional justice, um, with your experience at the UN Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo and at the pretrial chamber of the so-called Khmer Rouge Tribunal in Cambodia, uh, you're also um, experienced with complicated justice mechanisms that involve not only demands for justice but also international politics. 
and that have an international administration while paying respect to the context in which the crimes have been committed and to which justice is to ultimately serve, which is Syria. Um, so in this regard, I'm very, very excited that you could make it here and happy to, to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Patrick. Um, <laughs> thank you. Let me uh, start by saying uh, how much I'm grateful to, to Barbara and, and Wolfgang. Barbara for making it uh, happen and, and Wolfgang for inviting me to, to speak to you tonight. I am going to address the questions that I was asked to cover, uh, starting with the, uh, the question of uh, how being neither a court or being neither a prosecution office nor a court, the AAAM mandate is to best be understood. And there will be a, a couple of follow-up questions which I'll try to, to address. But let me first say that um, I think it was so important to start this evening by uh, listening to to the stories of those who are concerned by the crimes we are dealing with. Sometimes the lawyers uh, tend to hide behind the legal jargon, especially the international criminal la lawyers, and they give this impression that it's all about law, it's not about facts. I mean, those who know criminal law generally, but international crime particularly, know how much it is about facts. And um, I wish uh, we are uh, in a couple of years ahead uh, talking about legacy, about the trials uh, that will be handled and uh, that are taking place uh, already in, in small pieces uh, about the crimes committed in Syria. And I hope that we will be talking about the legacy as we, as we did with the crimes of the former Yugoslavia one day. And you will see that for the victims, for their children, what is important is the facts. So, not a, it starts with a lot of what we are not. We're not a prosecutor. We won't issue indictments, and we're not a court. We're not going to try anyone. So, when you put that in perspective with uh, what exists already, which is a lot of reporting, including excellent reporting from um, UN entities, from uh, excellent NGOs, one may wonder if you're not a court or a prosecutor office, why, why are you there in the first place? I think the answer, the easy answer to this question is that building the cases to go to trial, cases uh, covering crimes of that scale, that requires a lot of work. And those who have been working on those uh, issues in different and less difficult contexts most of the time than the Syrian context know how much it takes. So if you want to be able to have trials uh, on a larger scale for the, for, for the situation in Syria, you're gonna have to preserve the evidence that has been collected already. You're gonna have to fill the gaps. You're gonna have to analyze it using international criminal law standard or criminal law standard more generally, and not using the standard that um, different bodies and entities use when they report. They don't have to use the very demanding standards. If you make a report and you're satisfied that uh, the, the information on which you base your report is credible and that you have sufficient indicia uh, to conclude, you, you do it. And it's, there is nothing wrong with that. But satisfying a court that there is a case to answer, that's another story. That's why we are here. Even though uh, we will not be able to prosecute anyone, but we're not here alone and we're not replacing those who exist. So let me try to nav navigate that uh, a little bit with you. Because I've been asked to be a little uh, short, I will not uh, go back to the long list of horrifying uh, uh, situations and crimes. Barbara did it very well earlier and uh, I, uh, you know what I'm talking about. The only thing I want to add is that focusing on Sadnaya earlier was important because it reminds us not just of the horrific condition in the prison, it actually reminds us that um, the crimes we're talking about didn't start during a conflict. They started in 2011 when the violence intensified and when the regime decided to repress the hope for freedom that uh, Syrians were expressing at the time. And it's very important to remember that it has effects in terms of uh, the legal qualification, of course, uh, before conflict, you can't speak about certain types of crimes, but more generally, it gives us an idea of the starting point. 
So various entities, including the Commission of Inquiry on Syria, uh, including the OPCW fact-finding missions and the GIM, the Joint Investigative Mechanism, who are looking into instances of uh, use of chemical weapons and attributing responsibilities but, but not using criminal law standard again, uh, attributing, identifying responsible responsibilities for the, those use. Uh, have been reporting extensively. That's not all. We heard, uh, obviously, of uh, Amnesty's report, uh, and there are numerous, and we heard of uh, the work that a number of NGOs who are either advocating or, um, or actually litigating, which is also very important, but we also talk about NGOs who are collecting material information, sometimes evidence, they do it not with a mandate of, a judicial mandate, if you wish, but they do it and collect material which is extremely important when uh, a mechanism like the one that I have the privilege to head is starting its operations. This is lead information, this is identification of potential witnesses, and this is uh, materials which have already been collected and in part analyzed. Other NGOs are focusing more on, uh, on other aspects of uh, the crimes. Some are focusing on criminal responsibilities and they, are, they play a very important role as well. The Commission inquiry is well known for uh, having digged a lot of information with the support of a, of a number of NGOs and, and direct witnesses that they, they interviewed uh, on what we call in the jargon the crime base which is extremely important. It's not enough to bring a, a case to trial, but it's extremely important. They also map the events. So we're not starting from scratch, but what we're meant to do is basically twofold. Collecting, consolidating, pre preserving, analyzing the evidence and the information collected. And on the other end, preparing files, as you heard from Patrick. Pre preparing files in order to facilitate and expedite uh, independent uh, criminal proceedings in accordance with international law. Who is going to take, uh, to receive the files in question? That at the moment seems very likely to be national jurisdiction, but we hope firmly that in the not too distant future, uh, the fact that files have been built, filed of a, a sufficient um, professional and, and serious uh, 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 with, a such, uh, with a sufficient professional and serious uh, basis to constitute compelling reason for deciding that reporting is enough. Now we need to go for justice and we need to have an international instance to deal with those crimes. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, while the IIIM is collecting information and evidence, what it can do, which may have a very direct impact, and I've been uh, extensively engaging with a number of stakeholders uh, to that end, is to support national prosecution. As you've heard at the beginning of this event tonight, the current first responders, prosecutorial and judicial responders, are national authorities. Not a huge amount of them, but a, a good uh, two handful of them. Uh, mostly in Europe, Germany uh, playing a very important part, obviously. And uh, this is bringing us a lot of hope. In, in a number of situations that I've dealt with previously uh, as a judge, as an international judge, we were talking about the international um, mechanism, tribunals, uh, dealing with the situation first and then working because they can't handle the totality of the crime. Obviously, it's never possible. Working hand-to-hand -hand with national jurisdiction often in the country, and that's what we hope one day for, for Syria, to continue with other cases, to continue addressing the cases that, uh, the multiple cases that the international jurisdiction can't, can't handle. At the moment, in, with the situation in Syria, we're faced with the opposite situation. It's actually the civil society, not, not originally the, the prosecutors or the judges who are taking the lead. It's a civil society that decides that report is enough and now we need action, judicial action. They convince very courageous and, 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 and very professional prosecutors that they have cases. And you have prosecutors who are also doing their work and 
using the, the tools they have, including, in, including universal jurisdiction, working with these um, entities that have collected information, working together. Uh, I understand that uh, seeing people on the panel that uh, we're probably going to discuss about that as well. And they are, in fact, uh, making justice possible not always at the highest level, not always uh, with the scope that we would want, but that's an excellent start. Uh, so what I see the mechanism's uh, role is really to, to build on what others have collected, to analyze the information and the evidence collected, to identify the gaps, as we said. We have an investigative mandate. It has a, a major... Uh, it faces a major difficulty, which is that we are not, at the moment at least, in a position to go in Syria. So again, those who can go in Syria, and there are some in this room uh, or, or who have contact in Syria, they are uh, extremely important partners uh, to do the work that we're meant to do. And at the same time, we have the means to continue the investigation, to fill the gap, to uh, basically not just build cases, which, is, which would be big enough a task, I would say, but also as we collect, to identify the material that could feed in national prosecutions. And that's a very interesting and important aspect. But for that to happen, what we need to do is to basically uh, work sufficiently uh, closely with the national prosecution to be able to uh, receive operational, opera uh, operational information about the ongoing investigation so that we can identify the material that we collect that they don't have and that we have. This is not uh, just IDs. I'd like to tell you where we stand at the moment. Uh, but I will start with uh, the, the collection. I mean, it's too slow for my taste, as you can imagine. Uh, when you have such a big task ahead, you would want things to go extremely fast. But you need to, to build the foundation for that work. Um, Patrick was uh, using a few, few words that I've used earlier about building trust. I mean, you don't uh, come to collect information or evidence that others have sometimes collected at the putting their own lives in danger without first building a relationship of, of trust. And there are expectations uh, from those uh, who collect the information. The first expectation is that you're going to treat it professionally, safely, that you're not going to endanger anyone in receiving information, that you're not going to have leaks, and uh, that if which is very likely uh, your systems are under attacks, that you have built sufficient uh, system in place to protect the information. At the same time, those who have collected information want uh, to, to receive feedback. That seems such a natural uh, request that uh, one wonder why that would be difficult to, to answer positively. Um, this is something that I respect very much, and to the extent possible, the AAAM will give feedback to uh, the partners and the stakeholders with which it works. Uh, feedback can be in many forms. Feedback can be about the use, the usefulness of the material which has been provided. Feedback can be about the need for further information or evidence that those stakeholders can help you uh, to identify. Feedback can be uh, of when you've been successfully supporting a national prosecution, uh, following up what's going on with the evidence in question and being able to sometimes give, give the good news that it's been very useful, sometimes explain that the credit of the material in question has been questioned and that you need to ask yourself more questions about how to uh, professionally receive uh, material to be used in court. Am I still good on time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> because I've been under a strict rule uh, myself and if I, if I can't stick to that, I know that um, this will be cut. So, Working with states is also extremely important. As you can imagine, uh, when I give the, the little list, it's just a little uh, part of the top of the iceberg of uh, uh, entities, including within the UN, that have been receiving information. A lot of them have received information from state. And as a UN body that not every state likes, but that uh, a large number of states uh, voted in favor of uh, uh, last uh, December, uh, we are in a position with the support from the General Assembly to ask state to cooperate and to give us 
uh, material uh, relevant to our mandate. And it's very important for us to do exactly that, to build the same trust with the states that they can share that material with us, that we have a common purpose, which is to bring accountability for those crimes, that we will build the protocols and the measures that will allow us to be impartial and independent, working with state, working with the uh, civil society that have interest at stake, requires a, a, a mechanism like the AAAM to be very strict on maintaining impartiality and independence. Maintaining impartiality is not just about looking for uh, exculpatory as well as inculpatory uh, evidence. It's also about putting a limit to the extent to which other stakeholders can influence your actions and your work. We need to listen to those who know what happened in Syria. We need to get the context right. We need to obviously uh, engage and be uh, in, in close cooperation with, but we can't get, be it a state or, uh, or an NGO, interfere with certain aspect of our work uh, which are substantive. That wouldn't be understood and that would undermine the credibility of our action and the possibility of national jurisdiction or international ones to rely on our material or our analysis. I realized because I cut a lot of things that I wanted to tell you that I actually forgot one important thing. I said we will not issue indictment and that's clear, it's not our mandate, but how close to that will we go? I think it's an important thing to, to indicate. I would say for those of you who are familiar with uh, what goes into an indictment, it's really about uh, establishing the material element of the crimes, and we're talking here about crimes which are complex in nature, um, and the material elements of the uh, forms of uh, responsibility that you believe can be applied to a particular suspect. So it's not just about compiling evidence for us, to establish a little list of maybe names of people we consider to be, uh, to be uh, responsible for those crimes and that we would recommend a prosecutor to look at. It's also about articulating very precisely in document that prosecutors could use when building their indictment, uh, all the elements that we believe should, be, should find their way into such a document. So it's really the same work that a prosecution team uh, until the, the indictment is issued uh, would undertake. And for that, the mechanism is actually hiring um, experts whose expertise can be in many, many fields, but uh, to talk about the substantive part, I would say um, investigators, uh, analysts in various uh, fields, again, uh, military ex expertise, uh, video, open source uh, analysts, uh, uh, sexual violence and, 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 and crimes uh, expertise, all of that to be built in the team, lawyers with prosecutorial, but not just prosecutorial experience, uh, also with a defense approach, understanding what needs to be in a case and what can be, uh, how you can test a case so that the cases are the strongest possible what in my jargon I call chambers, that is judicial expertise as well, knowing that if you have built a document that you believe could be signed off uh, by a prosecutor, and no prosecutor will do that, obviously. A, a reasonable prosecutor will test your, your evidence and your material and test your analysis, but provided that this document goes forward and someone is arrested uh, on the basis of a charge, would that case stand trial? When you listen to that, you realize why I'm saying that the, the quality reports that we've seen, and there have been so many about the crimes in Syria, cannot get close uh, to the level of specificity that uh, judicial documents require, judicial or prosecutorial documents. That's why this work is important, and that's why it's important to do it here. I'm, I'm, I don't see uh, Anwar, oh yes, he's here. We have a little disagreement with Anwar because he, in the first place, didn't think that uh, the AAAM was such a great idea, and it has nothing to do, I know, just about the acronym, which is unpronounceable. He was thinking you need an international tribunal. You don't need a, a thing, huh? a mechanism. But really, this work, Anwar, would have to be done by any court. Any court that you constitute today, even if you give jurisdiction to the ICC, this work will have to be done. So it's not time lost. If we do it well, believe me, altogether, 
this can be an extremely powerful uh, tool and hopefully a tool that will change the approach that the international community has to building uh, accountability for, crime, for atrocity crimes. I would be um, among those who actually engage in one way or another by aiding and abetting, by uh, committing or uh, by uh, doing any other form of support to the commission of those crimes. I would start worry, really, because we're not going to let it go. It will take time. The mechanism will not do it alone. That's impossible. But I'm sure that altogether we can actually achieve something really meaningful. And I'm saying that knowing that managing expectation of the victims is a very serious matter. So I'm not promising any specific outcome. I'm just saying that the means, the will, the expertise is there. I don't see how this cannot lead to something uh, that we can be proud of in the end. I don't see, maybe not me, maybe someone else will come, but we, we have to succeed. Uh, thank you so much, Kathleen, uh, for um, for these these many many insights and and detailed account of uh, and clarification also of, of your mission and and your role. And I think many of the issues that uh, you have tackled we will uh, we will take up during our panel discussion, um, which will be uh, precisely also on on this topic of of collection and preser preservation of evidence. Um, and, and the reason why I, I spoke to all of you about this time issue that was mentioned is because you see here five people, uh, one really more qualified and, and interesting to listen to uh, than the other. And um, I want to make sure that we get the chance to, to hear in depth what, what they have to say. Um, Mazen, I um, really liked about Katrin's uh, beginning of talking about the truth, um, because that's uh, something that uh, we as lawyers shouldn't forget. Uh, there, there, there is a, a human right to the truth for, for some reason. Um, and you are, um, um, you are uh, working to search for the truth for, for a long, long time already. Um, you don't need actually a lot of introduction to many people here, um, but I will still do it. You are a lawyer, a journalist, and you're the president of the Syrian Center uh, for Media and Freedom of Speech um, that we had on the earlier panel, uh, which is one of the two organizations that filed the criminal complaints um, with the ECCHR uh, today. Um, and SCM, and that was also already mentioned before, was an or is an organization that was severely targeted by Air Force Intelligence itself in February 2012, with 14 employees arrested and, and tortured, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so really, that that part is, is it's a central part of the very complaint that we handed in. Um, and in this capacity, you're also a witness, and you testified yourself already in the proceedings in Germany. Um, with SCM, with the organization, uh, you have long before we heard that these violations have been going on, not only since 2011, but from long before. And in 2004, you founded this organization and documented human rights abuses since its very beginning. Um, and now, since we try to open avenues for justice, uh, you're also active in that regard. Um, you not only litigate here in Germany with us, but also SCM is active in other European jurisdictions. So um, let me ask you, kind of in this professional capacity, um, we heard about the expectations that Katrin is also aware of coming from civil society organizations. What, what do you expect from the IIIM for paving the road towards justice and accountability, and how do you plan to, to engage with it? Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you allow me, I will shift to Arabic. I'm sorry to bother you. Okay. Vielen Dank, uh, Patrick. Uh, vielen Dank, Katrin. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Katrin, for your honesty that we're used to. This might be the first basis for uh, building uh, trust building measures. We know that the IIIM uh, will not uh, issue indictments, but despite all, it's very important to us out of three aspects. The 
place in which the Security Council were closed the way to the ICC, which was our speculation, which was the hope of every victim where crimes of war or crimes against humanity were committed. And against the backdrop of the Iranian and Russian veto, there had to be political alternatives, even if they were more of ethical nature. That is why the foundation or the initiation of the IIIM by the General Assembly, this per se was a, a, a success, even especially if we can have some optimism that maybe later, someday, there will be a possibility to erect a special tribunal uh, through the General Assembly of the United Nations. In a political context, let me uh, put it in general words, but Catherine also said that the preparation of file cases, and um, you, Patrick, this know that this is not an easy process. This is not an, a normal uh, process. Uh, there is a huge difference between the human rights documentation that might be a uh, constraint to the monitoring of victims and the violations committed against them. Uh, but there is a vast difference between that and the preparation of file cases and the uh, preparation to file them to uh, uh, crime courts, criminal courts. This needs a different quality of work and different uh, quality of efforts. If the triple I M are in the position to do that, this will save us huge amount of time and effort and will um, heighten the quality of documentation and will ameliorate the um, quality of evidence with the start of the Arab Spring, with the um, eruption of the revolution in Syria, we were quickly aware that the documentation will be a matter of importance because the number of victims is not anymore connected to uh, politicians or to the Islamists. We have widespread violations and um, very erratic violations against uh, of human rights. But it was n it never occurred to us that documentation will be as important or that the extent of violations will be as huge and diverse. This huge extent of violations forced us with time to acknowledge that we don't have the capacity. Many other Syrian, gov uh, Syrian organizations, by the way, uh, I'm also happy that our colleague Fadl Abdel Ghani is also here today because one of the first organizations that worked on the uh, subject of documentation since 2011. N no organization was able to follow up on all these violations. This is why it's extremely important that a mechanism as the Triple I M exists, that it organizes the file cases, that the file cases are kept in a safe place because in Syria the problem isn't finding the evidence. Uh, myself, one of the most crimes that I studied or researched in this huge extent, in, none had that extent or that many evidence, even material evidence, but this is all widespread and not collected in one place. It needs to be in a trusted, safe place where it can be stored in order to be able to buy, complete, uh, to build complete file cases. And if we have the political and judicial, judicial um, possibility, we can head to a court. There are problems of documentation connected to the victims themselves, because today it's very difficult when talking about the um, victory of the regime, of the rehabilitation of the regime, it's very difficult to obtain testimonies by the victims because the victims have started to feel that they could be again subject to revenge of the regime if the regime is indeed reintegrated in the international community and the victor will be the one c controlling everything if this really happens. This is why we need a UN-connected uh, mechanism or entity to follow up on this so that we encourage the victims to testify, to not hide away, and to not um, uh, keep it a secret. The triple IM is of extreme importance to us because there are attempts by, through political negotiations or be it through uh, the reality on the ground to completely ignore the accountability issue in Syria. 
in the Geneva negotiations, and we as civil society, we participate. And when we uh, open the issue of accountability, we are pictured as if we want to go to war. We're pictured as if we are crazy heads who do not want peace. Because all parties are involved in crimes of war, and this is why accountability would not lead to peace, while impunity is indeed uh, the peace blocker in Syria. Impunity will result in more wars based on the will of revenge and the need to revenge. This is why the Triple IM will keep the accountability file open, the transitional justice file open. This this will what will keep them on the table. In the absence of any mechanism, international acknowledged mechanism, it will be much easier for the conflict parties and for the international actors even for entities inside the United Nations to ignore the issue of justice despite the great effort and the great work done by the Syrian civil society and the international organizations in general. I could count a lot, but Patrick said to um, limit the time, and this is why I will come to a halt now. Thank you, Mazen. Um, Donatella, Mazen said no organ or organization can collect evidence of all violations that have been committed in Syria. Um, you, uh, born in Italy, raised in France, educated in the UK, are now Amnesty International senior investigator on crisis response. Uh, and that's a job that takes you to the world's most dangerous and desperate areas, and you're working for an organization with a lot of resources to try to document many, many of the violations that are happening in Syria. Um, you have been to Syria, to Libya, to conflicts in Gaza, in Sudan. Um, and if my research is correct, then you were in Syria in 2012, 2013, and also in, in last year to, to document different, different aspects of all these violations. Um, and um, we have seen already some uh, impressive um, demonstration of the work that Amnesty is, is, has been done on Syria. Maybe you can tell us a bit uh, about, about your work and, and also um, how the documentation of such crimes, of these crimes in Syria, maybe is, is different from, from the other situations that you know. <laughs> okay, is this working? Uh, yeah, working. okay. Um, so I have five minutes, I'll race through this. I'm not going to talk about uh, our, the work of Amnesty International on detainees that has been done earlier. Uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges of collecting and preserving evidence over the different stages of the conflict in Syria. So I spent a lot of time working on the grounds in 2012-13, then it became impossible because everybody was being abducted and I was able to return to Syria earlier this year. Again, I haven't been able to work everywhere in Syria because we have no access to areas under the control of government forces. So um, the issue of multi-layer destruction uh, today, that's what Raqqa looks today and many other places in Syria. That means that uh, quite apart to whatever uh, crime, if some of the attacks that left Raqqa looking like this were indeed unlawful, but the question is also how much, how much have they destroyed of the evidence of crimes that were committed before. I was in Syria in 2013. Um, I looked at places that had been hit by artillery and airstrikes. Um, all those places are, have gone now, so, and, and, with, and, and with them, uh, the evidence. Um, going back to the different phases and, and the challenges of collecting information at the time, uh, so it started with peaceful demonstration. At the time I was observing those demonstrations, I was in the country legally, so um, there wasn't much that I could do by way of like uh, videoing, taking photographs during the demonstrations. I had to rely on other people to do that. Um, I was observing people being shot, um, 
killed and injured peaceful demonstrators. Uh, they could not go to hospitals, to ordinary hospitals. So people were being treated in, in sort of clinics where some sympathetic doctors would look after them or in private houses like this. Obtaining medical records like this was extremely difficult because um, um, medical staff, medics, uh, were uh, scared. Why? Because the regime was targeting uh, medics. Um, this is just one example uh, where young medics were, who were those who were um, specifically looking after demonstrators who'd been shot, were arrested. Uh, tortured, killed, and their bodies were burned, their identity cards were left next to their bodies so that people would know the kind of the risk uh, that they ran. The paper trail was elusive all over. So in, in you know, some cases, one could obtain uh, summons, but most cases, people were picked up from the street, from their homes. There was no record of their uh, detention. Families were terribly scared, whether their relatives were detained, disappeared, or extrajudicially executed. Um, cases like this, where the mother of these three a uh, young man spoke openly in early 2012, this was in the Idlib province, were really quite rare. People were just not willing to go uh, on the record. They were too scared. Um, uh, in, in cases like this, families would resort to, uh, they wouldn't get the bodies back of their uh, extrajudicially executed relatives. In this case, um, their relatives uh, found the um, the uh, video of, of the body. Um, the guy was wearing the same, exactly the same T-shirt that their son had been wearing when, when he was arrested. It's, it's one way of trying to uh, put facts together uh, under those uh, circumstances. Um, I invested a case where nine people were extrajudicially executed in this house. This was in Taftanaz in Idlib. Um, I was able to go back the following year. The house was still there. I've got some photos. I've got some testimonies. That house no longer exists today because Taftanaz has been bombed to smithers. So that evidence is, is gone. Um, uh, before places were, were, were being bombed, as we will see in a second, places were being burned down. Again, not just uh, the evidence of the crime, but, but documents that um, family may have collected about um, other uh, violations that, are, that had happened to, to their uh, family members, uh, gone. Um, same thing with, um, I mean, I spent time looking at damage done to building with ballistic as experts by artillery and so on. Those areas are now completely flattened. That evidence is gone. Um, issue of uh, identifying weapons that were being used by uh, those who were perpetrating those attacks, in this case, uh, Syrian uh, regime. The issue of ordinary people, whether they were armed groups, rebels, or ordinary citizens, tampering with the evidence because they didn't know. I was in uh, in this neighborhood at the time when a massive cluster bomb was launched on 1st of March 2012 in Aleppo. Uh, while I was going around the building and, and, and taking photographs of the various um, cluster submunitions in locations, it, it, you know, within half an hour I come down and an armed group that was located not far from there had kind of gone around, collected, assembled everything nearby, thereby you know, not on purpose, but removing the possibility of, of me being able to look at where the individual, you know, some of these individual submunition had fallen. Uh, so sometimes the uh, disturbing or destroying the evidence is done not in bad faith, just because people don't know. Um, then we started to see very large scale attacks. This was a ballistic attack, January, February 2013, in three different districts of Aleppo. Again, that's what those districts look like. You can imagine um, how much evidence was destroyed in the process and how difficult it was by then to work on this, um, to even just like be able to compile a list of all the people who had been killed. There were so many. By then, ISIS was already 
um, very active and present in Aleppo, it was for people like myself very difficult to work. I could not work very openly anymore. Uh, I could not spend a lot of time in a single place. So um, that was one of the challenges. And finally, mass flight, people started to leave. Um, and not everybody is well known, not everybody is connected. So um, some of the people who gave their testimony earlier on, um, we've seen, you know, it, it's their traces may have been lost. So I hope I've uh, kept to my time. And uh, these are really just some of the challenges that um, I've encountered in, in, in collecting evidence um, of uh, some of the crimes that have been committed in Syria over the last few years. Having said that, um, as has already been mentioned by other speakers, the, the scope, the breadth, the extent of the crimes is so enormous that, uh, and the work that has been done collectively by so many courageous people you know, on the grounds and, and, and outside means that thankfully um, there is a lot of evidence and, and the perpetrators uh, must know that uh, they won't be able to get away forever uh, about all the crimes that they've committed. So um, I want to end on that, which is a, a bit of an optimistic note. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donatella, for this very first-hand account uh, and a very detailed one about the different violations and, and their documentation. Um, Chris, regarding the use of evidence collected by non-state entities, uh, you are an expert for two different reasons. One, you have over 11 years of experience focusing on international criminal law and criminal justice reform, ranging from Afghanistan to Bosnia-Herzegovina and Cambodia. Um, second, Currently, you are a Deputy Director for Investigations and Operations for the Commission for International Justice and Accountability, in short, CJA, uh, in which role you oversee the organization's criminal investigations in Syria and Iraq, which are quite extensive, I think I can say. Um, the different elements that go into case building and that are important have already been mentioned by Catherine before, um, speaking about crime-based evidence, witness evidence, but also, if we look at um, the focus of much of our work, also uh, the, the participation of survivors, outreach, advocacy, everything that you need to build a case, CJA is focused on one aspect particularly regarding case building, and that's linkage evidence that has also already been mentioned, um, and which is often a gap, actually, for these kind of crimes. Maybe you could tell us what that is, first of all, and second, why it is important and in how far and how maybe you were able to, to, to close this gap? Sure. Um, is it on? Uh, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here. It's great to be in front of such a diverse audience and see uh, the range of backgrounds that uh, do come out and are interested in, in this topic because obviously I, like many of you, think it's a very important one. And, and if we do, let it fall from the public eye, it was said earlier, then uh, we risk, uh, we do risk uh, that the perpetrators of these crimes will go unpunished. And so, as, as was just mentioned, um, the organization I work with does indeed focus on one small element of, of this massive process um, of, about, number one, trying to bring peace, but indeed peace with justice to Syria so that it can be a stable and lasting peace. And, and that is to focus on criminal, the, the criminal investigative element um, of these crimes. And then more specifically, as Patrick just said, um, we do put a lot of energy into focusing on the linkage evidence. Um, and that's just shorthand, um, as was explained earlier, for connecting individuals at the top and middle level to the crimes that were committed on the grounds. Because it's, it is often easier to show that someone is responsible who was there, someone who was in the room, who did the torture, who pulled the trigger. Those crimes are often easier to prove than the, the charges against those at the top and in the middle. 
And so we spend a lot of time working on, on that evidence um, and, and helping uh, as, to contribute like everyone else in this room contributes uh, to the bigger picture, which now thankfully is going to be presented to uh, the, the IIIM um, and be put together in a very, I think, a very powerful way. But just to say a couple of things um, that I wanted to say about linkage evidence, maybe uh, some, some thoughts for the future and for those of you who are also considering maybe fa going farther than you have so far or, or thinking about your advocacy works in the future in ways that which um, you might also think about collecting advocacy, uh, thinking while you're collecting advocacy for advocacy purposes, also thinking about linkage issues as well. I know that it's a very diverse audience, as I said, so I'll just put some small points forward. One is that we often think in traditional ways about the difference between linkage and crime-based evidence. In the most simple terms, you think often that there's a, there's a victim who talks about the crimes committed against them, and that's where you get most of your crime-based evidence. And then up here, there are, if you're lucky, some documents that can show you who was in charge and who was in the chain of command. And that's your, that's your linkage evidence. But um, I would suggest that, it's, that, that much of, there's so much overlap in what, mean, what in one case might be crime-based and what in another case might be linkage that it might be helpful as a framework, but much of the evidence that's collected today is also going to be useful uh, for linkage evidence. Of course, if a victim can talk about the people who gave the orders to abuse them, if they can talk while they're walking down the aisles of, of, of a detention facility, who was sitting in the main office, this is not only crime-based evidence, but it's also linkage evidence. If, if documents talk about a chain of command, then of course, um, that's great linkage evidence, but you, all, you also will see in a documentation from time to time uh, confession statements, which really then tie directly to the crime base uh, that you're trying to prove as well. So um, conceptually, linkage and crime base is very important for, from a legal perspective, but there's so much overlap in the types of evidence collected for both, for both that um, I think that's an important element to, to, to look at when you're reviewing the types of evidence you collect, right? For us at CJA, we collect a lot of documentary evidence. We have over 7, 700,000 pages of regime documents. Um, we have a lot of video and digital data, and indeed we have uh, evidence from, from victims and witnesses as well. And this is just a small piece of what the rest of this great community here has collected and, and will be incredibly powerful over time. But if I can, one of the things that's also important um, in the limited time that I have to touch on is when you are addressing these issues, I think it's, it's also important um, to, to focus on what, what you can collect and what's most important. As was just seen, if you don't collect it now, it might be gone tomorrow. Um, so when, if you can collect documents, but if you can be safe about it, because remember, documents are not the same as people, right? It's one thing for the white helmets to be running into a building that's about to collapse. Of course, it's a very different thing to do the same for documents, and that is, an, that is a bridge too far, I would suggest. So while it is never safe in a conflict zone, you have to take reasonable and credible uh, steps to balance this idea of justice and the idea that information might be lost with safety. But at the same time, you also have to think about how you document that, that collection process because, as we've heard today, you don't know where it's going, right? So it might be one thing to collect documents that you think are important for a human rights purpose, but if you also considered addressing the chain of custody issues, they might be useful later on for criminal prosecutions. They might be useful in what we would consider a low threshold normally in international tribunals, but what you want to do is collect information that's of such a level that it could be used in whatever the jurisdiction is where someone might be found, right? Whether it's in Canada or in the UK or uh, in France or in Syria in the future, Right, and so when you think about what is, what's it going to look like, what's, what's, the, what's the criminal procedure going to be like in Syria in the future when there is peace and there is transitional justice, you need to think about those mechanisms as well so you're sure that you can use this information later. But lastly, you should also think about, in my opinion, how you're going to use that information when you're talking to people, right? 
Because if you, if you go and collect information, but you tell people that you're only keeping it for yourself, then you've created a problem for yourself, right? Because then you're violating a great deal of trust if you then go and share it with domestic authorities, or you share it with the IIIM, or you share it with colleagues within uh, the, the human rights and the advocacy field. So I think you have to think about all of those possible options as well when you're at that point of capture or collection, or you could be doing damage to what might be a good opportunities in the future. And it's also, of course, very important that whoever it is that you're taking information from, whether it's a flash drive, a phone, an image, not only do you get their story so that you can prove where it came from in the future, but you also get their approval for what it is that you're going to use it for in the future so that they know what the risks are that they're taking when they give it to you. But at the same time, they can feel comfortable in the fact that it's being used for very specific purposes. And just to demonstrate that in the, in, at the end, I think that one of the great things about the work that we've all been doing is the cooperation that we have had today. And so just as one organization sitting here today and knowing that we have had the opportunity to work with many of the organizations sitting out here in the audience and on the stage today, um, that's possible because we've thought about some of these things, luckily, because of mistakes we made in the past. And so because of that type of preparation and that type of forward-looking approach to whatever your, your first purpose is, but thinking with criminal evidence might be a part of it, then I think from now and in the future, we might have a, a great strong body of evidence that can be utilized for the mechanism in the short term, international justice hopefully in the midterm, and indeed Syrian local justice in the medium to long term. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for um, talking us through the very manifold aspects and indeed difficulties in, in doing the kind of, of work that you're engaged in um, and addressing one of the major gaps. Um, now, speaking of a different kind of gap, Marie, um, we um, have been speaking about how difficult it is for organizations to keep up with the number of uh, violations that have been committed. You are an independent journalist and researcher, which makes your work all the more impressive. Um, you have an expensive, extensive experience uh, working in Muslim countries uh, in conflict and in post-conflict transition. And as a journalist, you have been a correspondent in Afghanistan and in Istanbul and covering, among other countries, Suran, <laughs> Syria, Iran, <laughs> and Iraq, um, focusing on, on inter-alia human rights issues. And with regards to, to Syria now, my question relates to a very different gap because um, one, one of your works that, uh, one of your research works concern particularly the situation of women in, in this conflict, um, particularly in detention, uh, which includes but is not limited to rape and, and sexual violence. Um, and that is of um, the people who are engaged in international criminal law, many times an aspect that kind of falls under the table for different reasons. Um, shockingly. And um, that's why um, I'm sure that we would all love to hear about your work in this regard, uh, regarding the, the difficulty in documenting these crimes. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, it's working. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, well, I, I would say that my work investigating and documenting sexual violence, and more, more specifically rapes, has been shaped by the challenges and, and how difficult it was. Um, I would say the, the first and the main difficulty was the, the social stigma and the cultural taboo that goes with sexual violence. So you would say it's the same in any culture and in any country. It's always difficult to, to document sexual violence. Um, but I've worked on sexual violence in other countries and I can tell you that in Syria it was even more difficult. It was extremely hard. Um, for the non-Syrian people in the room, in Syria, in the Syrian culture, Honor is key for women, and a woman who's been sexually abused or is even just suspected of having been abused uh, might face very serious consequences. And I've, uh, I've heard many stories of women who had been rejected by their families or rejected by their husband who has poor divorce because they, they had suffered from sexual violence or were suspected of. So in this context, it's uh, obviously very, very difficult for them and to overcome the shame that goes with it. And I will um, tell you a short anecdote that will uh, give you a precise idea of the difficulty. 
uh, early on in my investigation, I spoke with a female gynecologist from Homs, and she was telling me that she saw many women who came to her with uh, obvious physical uh, signs that they had been raped, and none of them came for the consequences of the rape. They came for something else. And none of them said a word on the rape um, to, to the doctor. So I thought, okay, if, uh, if these women don't share anything with the doctor on one-on-one -on -one appointment, how is it gonna be possible to, to identify the survivors and, and have them talk? Um, and I actually managed to overcome this with the, the help of very dedicated um, activist social workers, um, and they helped me tremendously. But it was really key in the research to have the right intermediaries to, to reach out to the survivors. So there were other challenges, uh, more practical, um, as Donatella, Donatella mentioned, the fact that there have been so many refugees, so people are fleeing and it's very difficult to locate them. And when we can locate them, they start a new life and they don't want to look back, so it's difficult to, to go back to traumatic events. Um, also the fact that there is limited support for, for survivors, for women, um, especially psychological supports, uh, also make the, the work uh, much more difficult. Um, but I would like to, to focus on the second biggest uh, difficulty I, I faced. I think one of the sentences I've heard the most during the, the documentation time was, what's the benefit of talking? And, and as a researcher, it was the most difficult thing to answer, I would say, because it, it came at a time of, of disillusion and, and a feeling of betrayal from Syrian people. Um, after like the, the chemical attacks and the, the Caesar photo, people were telling me, okay, what, what, what kind of impact the report can have? What, what difference will it make? And, uh, and so that's also like a, a key obstacle. And mm, the majority of the, of the survivors um, I talk to don't believe in justice. They, they, they don't expect much from it. And that's understandable because in Syria there is no fair justice um, in place. And, and they have a very vague idea of what international justice could be. So I think I will end on the idea that um, more effort should be done on publicizing the efforts that are made to achieve uh, international justice. And, uh, and also the results. And especially, again, focusing on sexual violence. There, ha there have been some progresses recently with the Hisena break case and with the Bemba conviction. So this should probably be more publicized. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, achieving justice, you said, that's basically the, the, the goal that we all have, and that's um, why, why many people that are interested in how that works came here today. Um, Matthias, you are here in the capacity of uh, the head of the EU Genocide Network Secretariat. Um, before that, you were also the head of the Criminal Law Unit at the Department for International Cooperation and International Legal Assistance in the Ministry of Justice in Slovenia. And you also work with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Now, since May 2013, you're head of this network of European prosecution offices that are specialized in the investigation and prosecution of genocide, crimes against humanity, and, and war crimes. So um, the task of this network, maybe to say two words about that, is to ensure close cooperation between national authorities in, in investigating and prosecuting these crimes. Um, in this regard, it facilitates the exchange of information uh, amongst practitioners and it encourages their, their cooperation. And it provides a forum um, for sharing of knowledge and, and best practices. Um, now, this might seem very technical in the first sense, but the reason why this is so important is very straightforward, and I think it has been mentioned already several times before. We do need a judicial forum for these cases to go to somewhere. All of the documentation that we collect has to pass the bottleneck of some prosecution authority that takes up this, uh, makes it into legal evidence and prepares case files that can go to court. Um, and the only avenue we have so far um, are national jurisdictions. And if I understood you, Catherine, even you put a lot of hope in, in, in cooperating with these national jurisdictions. Um, 
But then, of course, they are in countries, uh, sometimes they have a bit more resources, not enough, but in Germany, they have at least some specialized, uh, or, or a bigger number of specialized offices working in it, but then there are smaller countries, and uh, basically none of these countries can do it all, so to say, so they depend on, on cooperating with, within each other, and, and basically you um, provide the forum for that, and uh, you have biannual meetings where they all come together, um, and in this, in this sense, I would like for you to, to maybe tell us a little bit about um, how these meetings work um, and, and how you think that they contribute to actually paving the road towards justice by these national prosecution authorities. Thank you very much um, for this kind introduction. And you said a lot what I had a plan to say. So uh, you saved some time there. So thanks a lot. And also thank you for um, assembling such a great audience to be here in the middle of the week. It's uh, almost 9.30 and you still listen about the topic of accountability for the crimes in Syria, which is not the, the, the light topic. And some, some could imagine something else for Wednesday evening. So, so I, I really congratulate you for, for, for being here with us. Um, in relation to, to the network, um, we just mentioned two aspects more, that that's a network that puts together investigators and prosecutors, um, which, is, which is very important when you discuss these um, issues. And also it um, covers basically um, national jurisdictions, European Union, uh, national authorities dealing with this type of, of crimes who are either specialized or, or somehow dedicated to deal with this, with this type of, of criminality. So in a way we cover all 28 um, jurisdictions plus have some, some observer states like US, Canada, Norway and Switzerland. Um, the forum provides basically a, a possibility for these authorities to meet, for prosecutors, investigators from various um, countries to meet and discuss these cases. Um, if we go basically with, with uh, it takes place in, in, in The Hague at Eurojust, which is European Union um, Agency for, for Judicial Cooperation. And um, it takes um, place, yes, as you said, twice per year. Sometimes we also had some additional meetings. Um, and of course, we try to address um, either um, contemporary conflicts, contemporary issues, or also just thematic issues. For example, we just had a meeting two weeks ago discussing um, how to, to ensure effective cooperation between um, NGOs and national authorities. Um, before we discuss how to use um, open source information, um, before that witness protection, sexual violence and so on and so forth. So basically those topics that investigators and prosecutors have to deal with on their daily basis, but of course need um, or um, get best practices from, from other states, cases, um, analysis of cases and so on and so forth. In relation to Syria, we actually tackled the situation already back in 2012 um, because it was quite obvious that with the proximity of the conflict of the territory to, to, the, to the European Union and taking into account experiences from Rwanda and Yugoslav um, um, conflict in the 90s, we understood from, from the outset uh, that when you have a refugee flow, you have uh, victims, witnesses, but also perpetrators that could hide you know, in those streams. So it was um, important to have everyone on board to understand that at some point these files will be on, 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 the, on tables to, to, be, to be discussed. Um, and um, in that way, of course, trying to understand the context, the structures, and so on and so forth. Um, in relation to, to um, what can be achieved then in terms of justice is of course certain things that needs to be understood. When, when we discuss about justice on national level, we need to understand that even when states have very open universal jurisdiction, they still like to see perpetrator on their territory. Um, some others actually do need to have a perpetrator on their territory, they need to have this link with the, or a presence of, 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 the, of the perpetrator on their territory to start the case. Um, one thing is, of course, efficiency and effectiveness of that, because um, there were cases in the beginning of 2000 where you had a very, when states had very open universal jurisdiction, and then, then basically the prospect of um, succeeding in, in any kind of effective judicial process were very limited. 
Um, so that's maybe one thing that we all need to understand, that when we talk about the, the Syrian regime, um, that's, of course, good to understand that we need to build, uh, collect information, build cases. But to have actually possibility in some jurisdiction for, for actual investigation, opening, launching investigations, you need to have the presence of that perpetrator. The good side, on the other side, is that these crimes are not statute barred. They're not time limited, to put it that way. Or they don't expire, if, if we put it that way. Um, so it means that as long as the perpetrator is alive, it can be tried, um, which is very helpful, of course, because that means unlike some other crimes on, on national level, for example, rape on national level usually has time prescription. But if that's a rape as a crime against humanity or as a war crime, it will not prescribe and the perpetrator could face justice um, until, until he or she is, is alive. So it's also important to take in, in, into account when we talk about justice. Justice is slow. It will not come fast. It will not come with a big uh, pomp and, and with a red carpet. It will come slow. Uh, uh, very quiet, but it will basically at some point deliver uh, the results. And we see some results now. What needs to be stressed is that European prosecutors are, are very focused on this topic. You've, you've seen some judgments already. Um, and that's something that's, that's a precedent towards the, the um, previous conflicts, because we still have an ongoing armed conflict in Syria, and we already have judgments relating to that same conflict. We already have judgments that have elaborated about the contextual elements of an armed conflict, that's a non-international armed conflict, and so on. Uh, because, of course, if we discuss evidence and, and how to preserve evidence, we talk about facts. But then we have to put these facts in a legal terminology so that they basically find their place in, 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 um, in the, the judicial process, which at the end of the day tells the truth. And that's the most important for all the victims, witnesses, also those who suffered, um, that, that at the end of the day there is a truth telling what has been done and only uh, truth-telling can be done through through judicial process because that goes beyond reasonable doubt. Um, another aspect in terms of um, evidence collection and, and again preservation of evidence is that national investigators and prosecutors on on, on national level they're like um, playing a bit with with uh, puzzles and that's where we're in a way network um, helps them because you might have an important witness of of a certain crime in one state and a perpetrator in another. Now, if they don't talk, if they don't know um, that, that's, that that's basically there, they will not be able to, to have a successful case. So it's important to put that together, and it's important also for, for all of the um, Syrian diaspora to still um, 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 kind of encourage witnesses to say, uh, what has happened, to go to, to law enforcement, to tell the stories, because maybe that might not be relevant for, for a case, any case, maybe here in Germany, but it might be relevant for, for some other jurisdiction, um, this same witness. So that's, in a way, how we're still in a process of putting uh, puzzles together. And I see here, of course, Triple IM will play an, 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 an a very significant role uh, as a kind of an umbrella overview on, on what, uh, what has been collected, what um, um, jurisdictions are doing, and being able to put to, to fill that, that gaps then, um, in, or those puzzles in, in the missing gaps. So I would um, conclude with, uh, with uh, that. Thank you, Matthias, for a very rare insight into the very practical aspects of how this uh, works. Um, you said it yourself, it's 9.30. I could sit and talk to you for, for hours, and maybe some of you too, but don't worry. Um, um, I would like to thank you very, very much, Katrin, Mazen, Donatella, Chris, Marie, and Matthias. I would uh, particularly want to thank our clients that I see as partners, we all see as our partners who came today um, for, for, for working with us and for, for supporting, um, for being our partners, period. Um, 
And I hope that you all, as a very patient audience, uh, with a very full day or full evening, uh, took away something about uh, the way towards justice in Syria. Um, I certainly did, um, and I think we all got to understand that it will take a lot of patience, uh, a lot of endurance when, if we want to go this, this road further and, and a road on which we will certainly uh, continue to need your support and we hope that you keep engaging with us. Thank you. And a very, and a very special thanks to the translators uh, behind in the booth, Nicola Bass and her colleague. Thank you so much. Our, our eyes and ears. <laughs>